Welcome to the Australian National University and to this event launching the ANU Southeast Asia Institute. Uh, my name is Robert Cribb, I'm the uh, convener of the Institute. Before we begin proceedings, I'd like to acknowledge and celebrate the first Australians on whose traditional lands we meet and to pay respects on behalf of all of us uh, to the elders of the Ngunnawal people past and present. Today's event will, it will commence with a lecture by our distinguished guest, and to introduce him, I invite to the podium uh, Professor Andrew McIntyre, Dean of the ANU College of Asia and the Pacific. Uh, thank you, Robert. Uh, uh, Dr. Surin, colleagues, uh, wonderful to have uh, so many people here this evening. Um, uh, it's a particular pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Surin Abdul Halim bin Ishmael in Swan. Um, uh, and to have him here to launch our new Southeast Asia Institute. Um, I think it's fair to say that Surin is probably one of the most internationally well-known Southeast Asians um, uh, going around in the world today. But it's not his fame and celebrity status uh, that make him so appropriate uh, for the role that he's here today for. It's the combination of experiences and achievements over the course of his life um, that uh, uh, make him so well suited. Because if anyone can lay claim to having not just great national credentials in Southeast Asia, but great Southeast Asian credentials, um, it's surely uh, Surin. Um, hailing from southern Thailand, uh, Surin um, has a strong Islamic and Malay heritage, even while growing up in a family uh, integrated into the broad spectrum uh, of Thai society. Uh, he studied at both Tamasat and Claremont Bekenna before undertaking his master's and doctorate at Harvard. Locals will be amused that the Silver Fox is claiming some credit for this. He, 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 he says he helped Surin along in, in some way, but as we know, the Silver Fox, Fox came to claims credit for lots of things. Um, uh, um, he's been a researcher and a teacher uh, at Tamasat, an American university in both Cairo uh, and Washington, D.C., where, appropriately enough, he taught a course in Southeast Asian affairs. Uh, he was also academic assistant to the dean at Tamasat, lucky dean, um, uh, and vice rector at Tamasat, lucky rector, um, uh, before you know, parliamentary career called him on. Uh, he entered parliament in 1986, and amongst a whole range of uh, uh, roles, he served as deputy leader of the Democratic Party and foreign minister from 97 to 2001, which, by my reckoning, up, up to that point, must have been one of the longest serving uh, foreign ministers in, um, uh, in Thai political history or modern Thai political history. Um, and it was while he was serving as foreign minister, he started to take on major Southeast Asian roles, in particular, chairing the ASEAN Regional Forum from 1999 to 2000. And it was in that capacity as chair of the ASEAN Regional Forum that he played such a critical role uh, in mobilising support uh, around Southeast Asia um, uh, for participation in and with uh, the UN uh, peacekeeping operations uh, in East Timor. And this was truly a significant change in the dynamics of international relations around Southeast Asia, to see that sort of uh, engagement by other governments uh, in, um, uh, in a domestic matter, or what began as a domestic matter. Um, and of course, as we all know him today, he, he serves now as Secretary General of ASEAN itself. If I look at Surin's life, such as I understand it, what, what, what stands out in it, uh, uh, for me, it's, it's a life of ideas, uh, it's a life of action, uh, it's a life of, of, of compassion, um, both within and across Southeast Asian borders, both formal borders and informal borders. Um, if anyone can lay claim to being a Southeast Asian today, it's surely Dr. Surin. Colleagues, Dr. Surin. Thank you very much, Professor McIntyre. As I recall, the only 
relationship I have with Jim Fox was we courted the same graduate student. <laughs> Both of us lost. <laughs> but colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, it is a great, great honor for me to stand in front of you at the launch of this institute. Can I just say that congratulations ANU for for discovering Southeast Asia. <laughs> we have discovered you long, long time ago. <laughs> but I think it is good that you would put, you know, all the resources, both human and the 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 books and the literature that you have, the experiences that you have, the sentiments and the engagement with the region that you have into one center. So that from now on you can focus and uh, you can make a contribution on the evolution of that region of the world which is extremely important to you, very contiguous to you and certainly a bridge and a center of gravity center of, uh, of action now. <clears throat> when I was asked to serve as Secretary General of RCM back in 2008, precisely I look at the landscape and I thought I have established enough of the connectivities, enough of the connections, enough of the relations that I could promote Southeast Asia ASEAN not only in its own consolidation and building of our community, but certainly with the uh, various major dialogue partners that have been part of our evolution all along since 1967. And for your information, Australia is the first dialogue partner that ASEAN has established with anybody. In the year 2014, you will be celebrating the 40th anniversary of your dialogue partnership with us. And this dialogue partnership is something that is very uniquely ASEAN. It is not only the 10 countries, but it is the relationship with the dialogue partners that help us grow, evolve, and are uh, able to um, establish ourselves in this new landscape of growth of dynamism called East Asia. We began in the reverse order from the European Union. The European Union began with major powers, major economies, working on functional issues, trying to avoid war, yes, but working on steel, on coal, working on energy. And then through the years, the European Union, European, uh, whatever it is, common market, have been able to bring in smaller countries to work with them. Now it's 27. ASEAN began in 1967 precisely for the reverse reason. There was a African Asia summit or meeting or Bandung conference, as you remember. And those major personalities somehow gave the leaders of ASEAN some pause for reflection. If we were to be dragged onto that stage, we would have lost our identity. We wouldn't be able to have our own stage, be ourselves, and keep our own agenda. The like of Nasser, the like of Nehru, the like of Joe and Lai, the like of Nkrumah, the like of Tito. You remember all those personalities. ASEAN decided that we need a forum. We needed a forum, small to ourselves, so that we can be ourselves. So from the very beginning, the idea was not to evolve a political union. Because we were all different. The idea was to create a group of countries in this region so that we can coordinate some of the policies that we could 
not interfering in each other's internal domestic issues. So the principle of non-interference from the very beginning. Two, two roads, two objectives of ASEAN from the very beginning, not very well articulated, but we have been able to achieve that. One is the march of democracy. Sounds very pompous, but slowly, slowly opening up, slowly giving space to people, slowly civil society grew, slowly meet the media is being more active, slowly academic freedom in all of us have been opened up more and more and more. And now I guess we can say that as a region, it is a very, very open and dynamic. Some of us are very noisy. Indonesia and Thailand would like to describe ourselves as noisy democracies. <laughs> but it is open. They are open. And now we are. So from 1967, most of us were very centralized. Most of us were authoritarian. Tanat Koman, the, the person who conceived of the idea of ASEAN, served under the military rule. Sarit and Tanon. I think Professor Reynolds would remember that. Those that generation would remember that. <clears throat> I'm not saying that you are old, Professor Reynolds, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so, you know, we, we began with a, a very centralized set of countries. Now, many of us have opened up. Some of us are you know, doing better, doing more than others, but on the road of opening up, of participation, of uh, trying to at least adopt the instruments of market economy and flourish as a result of it. The other one is economic development, for sure. From 1967 until now, you would have given us some credit for accomplishments for success in the economic management together. The Japanese came in the 60s, in the 70s, the Taiwanese came, the Koreans came, looking for a place where natural resources were abundant, cheap labor, but at the same time they could relocate what they call sunset industries to our part of the world. That's how it began. And then we ourselves started with import substitution industries. Industries that would produce products that we need for our own market. Slowly, those countries who came to invest, began to use us as a production base for export. Prosperity has been achieved step by step to the point where we are considered a middle-income region. Except Singapore and Brunei, they are above that. <laughs> but middle-income and doing quite well, attractive to a lot of investors. So the dual purposes of ASEAN from the beginning, we have pretty much achieved and success, been successful in uh, the two objectives, opening up the governance, the political structure, and economic prosperity. The model of growth of all of us from the beginning was capital from outside to invest in us, technology from outside to come to power those factories, management came from outside, toward the end we produce for the outside market. But that formula had worked, has served us well. And now we are in the process of trying to figure out 
how not to be caught in this middle income trap, which is labor intensive, outside technology, outside management, abundant resources, we are no longer abundant, labor is no longer cheap, we can't compete with India and China on that model. So all 10 of us now working feverishly trying to find a way out of this trap. Meaning we have to invest more in the, te in the technology, in the science, in the development, in the innovation, in trying to manage our economies in a way that we would be able to absorb all the elements from the region and from the global community and be able to produce effectively both goods and services for the global market. The reason that is kept us together is that very much, competing with the global community, complete, competing with China, complete, competing with India at this point. In the 80s, there was a phrase coming out of our leaders, India and China are sucking out oxygen from Southeast Asia. Investment. So we adopted a new strategy, and that is consolidate among ourselves, make sure that this is a 600 million consumers market, one integrated market, one production base, and uh, competitive among the emerging markets together and are able to integrate ourselves seamlessly into the global marketplace. Those are the four elements that are, we have been working on for our economic community. One integrated market, competitive, equitable among ourselves. In other words, there's not too big a gap. There's still a big gap among the membership and then are able to work with the world, benefit from the world, integrate into the global community. Those are the four objectives that we are working on. And dialogue partners are important. Because things have changed. The landscape has changed. It is no longer Southeast Asia in a distance. It is Southeast Asia that is in the middle of the growth center of the world. So you can't ignore strategic issues. You can't ignore partners who can help you balance the contending forces, opposing forces, playing in the region. And uh, that's why there is more than just establishing an ASEAN community, economic, political, and sociocultural, consolidate ourselves, make sure that we are one production base, make sure that we are one consuming market, but also we evolve architectures of cooperation on other issues that are important to keep the region stable and secure and balanced. It was Henry, Henry Kissinger who said at the end of last century that East Asia as far as innovation, economic prosperity, growth, East Asia is comparable to 20th century Europe. He said it at the end of last century. But as far as systems, institutions, process, that would take care of any problems that could come up between them and among them, and there are a lot of them. Flashpoints, historical baggage. He said East Asia is pretty much 19th century Europe. ASEAN has been responding to that observation. We have to create institutions, we have to create systems and processes so that contending powers into this region can find at least a fulcrum, can find a form, can find a stage that somehow we can balance out their interests. That's ASEAN centrality. 
That's ASEAN sitting in the driver's seat. That's ASEAN trying to play that role that other major powers in the region would have difficulties playing. The Japanese would not trust the Chinese, and vice versa. The Koreans will not trust the Japanese. The Indians will not trust the Chinese. Would Australia trust New Zealand? <laughs> we were talking at the, at the foreign ministry this morning that um, what's going on between Australia and Southeast Asia and Asia? Is both in the open, formal, diplomatic, recognized, and the subterranean relationship. We have done a great deal. We have done a lot together. Professor McIntyre, you mentioned East Timor. But there are other things that we have worked together. In 1999, East Timor, I was in the chair. ASEAN would have been diminished in our profile, in the confidence that the international community would have for us, about us, if somehow we could not make any contribution, not ambitious enough to say that we could solve it, the fire in East Timor. But at least we have to show the world that we are willing to take part. You remember there was a uh, APEC summit in Auckland in September. Usually it would be in November, but when it came to the Southern Hemisphere, it would be too hot. It would be in your uh, holidays. Therefore, at that time, Prime Minister Chipley yeah, moved it to, to September. <clears throat> and East Timor was burning. And Australia was under pressure. And we up there were thinking there must be a way that we can help, because this is in our backyard, this is in our front yard. But how to connect with Australia? Knowing that there is a lot of hesitation about Australia in East Timor. I'm not going to go into detail. So, before leaving Andrew Air Force Base, Mr. Clinton made a very, very strong statement, appealing, pressuring Jakarta to open up, let the international force in to help you. Mr. Howard called my Prime Minister, Chair of ASEAN at that time, please do something as Chair of ASEAN. Mr. Kofi Annan called from New York into Bangkok. A lot of expectation, a lot of pressure. In. All these things is behind the scene. What you saw was an ASEAN decision in Auckland saying that we would go and participate at the level, at the point, member states where we are prepared to and ready. It was not an ASEAN decision. Because some of the ASEAN countries were very reluctant. We are not prepared. We are not ready. We are not going to interfere for fear that such thing would happen to them. So non-interference was sacred because we don't want you to march into our country if something happened similar to what happened in East Timor. So I went from Auckland, I went to Jakarta. And first I was conducted to meet with General Veranto, who was the chief of the armed forces, and he had this to say. Please come, ASEAN, Asian, come in large number. We want to see your faces in East Timor. Then I was conducted to the presidential palace, President Habibi. Please come, same formula, 
come in large number. We want to see your friendly faces on East Timor. But he went further. Take the commandership of the international force being put together. And if you can't, give it to one of the Nordic countries. <laughs> you, you read between the lines. You see the subtlety. What he meant without saying is, please don't give it to Australia. <laughs> but he didn't have to say. And I said, Mr. President, we are not going to come that large, that big. We don't have the resources. We don't have the technology. And he said, but discuss with the Nordic countries, any one of them would be better than Australia. He didn't say it. <laughs> we were in the middle of the crisis, you remember. 1999, we were in the middle of the crisis. How could we send, in the case of Thailand, 1,800 troops, the Philippines, 17, 1,800 troops? We could. We had to go to the Japanese. And the Japanese asked us how much you want. We say 50 million would be good. And the permanent representative in, at the UN, he said, give me 24 hours, I'll give you the answer tomorrow. The next morning he called us, he said, I can do better than what you asked for. Tokyo authorized me to give you 100 million. Together we were able, in our language, to put law and to re-establish law and order in East Timor. A lot of people don't know this below the surface dealing, discussion, planning, and coordination. And the success of East Timor, yes, Mr. McIntyre, somewhat has changed ASEAN's concept of absolute non-interference. That we could make a contribution, that we could help maintain or re-establish law and order. And it is to our credit that General Crossgrove would take a tie as his deputy. That he would give the ASEAN elements there. Some of them were just with the flag. Some of them were just with medical team, but they were there to give us the space, to give us the opportunity to play our role. Not as ASEAN, but as separate neighbors of Indonesia. Because we couldn't use ASEAN yet at that time, because it's not ASEAN. So, a lot of these things were part and parcel of the experiences that we have gone through together, difficult periods of our history. In 19, in the year 2000, Thailand ran a candidate for the WTO. Our Deputy Prime Minister. Your neighbor to the south ran its own former Prime Minister, Mike Moore. It's the only international campaign that I'm aware of that Australia and New Zealand walk apart. Australia supported a candidate from ASEAN. New Zealand had its own candidate. Even more funny than that, it's the only international campaign that India-Pakistan came together. <laughs> Supported the candidate from ASEAN. A lot of these anecdotes are important for our trust, our confidence, and forming a foundation for the relationship, for the cooperation that we have with each other. Now, the landscape of East Asia is full of flashpoints. 
Australia, for the past three, four decades, has been working on re-establishing your own connection with the countries of Southeast Asia as a bridge to the larger landscape of East Asia in general. Because before that, the perception was a European country happened to be in the eastern part of the globe. That was the impression from here, and that was the impression from there. But when Southeast Asia grew systematically, steadily, economically, through that infusion of resources, of investment, of technology, of management from Japan, Taiwan, Korea, and we were able to achieve our own steady growth. It was about time that Australia look up, and we appreciate it. But something is happening up there that Australia would like to be a part of that Australia sees it as a strategic advantage to be, a, to be connected with that part going to a larger landscape of East Asia. That's when the idea of APEC came into being. Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation. It was your idea. But it was welcome, and it was supported, and it became an architecture for economic cooperation in East Asia. Later on, others joined. But my point is the sentiments, the proximity, and the timely way of which we adjust our own perceptions of each other help form a foundation for stronger and closer cooperation between Australia and the countries of Southeast Asia, in this case, ASEAN. And I hope that we will continue to be on that road. I hope that we will continue to work together on many, many other issues. A lot of issues you can't solve your own. It's human smuggling, drug, terrorism, environment, climate. All these things are issues without borders, issues without passports, issues without visas. And I think you have established a lot of working relationship, effective with many of us up there, to make sure that some of these problems are handled and managed up there effectively. You've been working with our immigration people. You've been working with our law enforcement people. You've been working with our customs people. These are the kind of things that I think afford Australia with a lot of benefits and a lot of uh, goodwill. These are the kind of things that keep Australia a lucky country. Because you are no longer isolated. If the ocean is the connectivity. You remember what happened in, in Hong Kong in the late 90s? Zaha. In 24 hours, Toronto was suffering from the same disease. How did it get there? Before globalization, it wouldn't get there that fast anyway. So. A lot of opportunities, a center of new gravity, a lot of problems, a lot of challenges. We appreciate your support, your posturing, and your understanding that only working together, and ASEAN is that institution, that organization in the region that has been coordinating on all these issues. And I've discussed with DFAT people this morning. Of course you have your bilateral relationship, bilateral programs, bilateral activities with a lot of countries in ASEAN. 
but keep the ASEAN perspective in mind. If you help train human resources, how does this contribute to the larger frame of ASEAN? If you help infrastructure, how does this stretch of road, if you want to do it, going to help the connectivity of ASEAN? We are working on all those issues, and it would be extremely helpful if our dialogue partners in Australia would also keep that in mind, that there is a larger picture for you. And you are going to contribute that organization, that group of countries, to behave as a group, to cooperate effectively, managing their own problems. And if they succeed, the result of that success is also going to be yours, because we are not that far apart. So, myself, I've been trying to tell our, our friends in the region that you can't keep external partners out of the region. ASEAN is in the center of the new growth center of the world. Everybody has an interest in this part of the world because we have become more important to the world than five years ago, than ten years ago, as a result of what's happening in Europe and North America. So there is, it's, it's not right, it's irrational, and you can't do it. Everybody is going to come onto this landscape. The only thing that ASEAN can do is learn to handle the contending opposing forces. And external powers rivalry in our region will play itself out on the ASEAN stage, nowhere else, because there is no other stage. It'll have to be on the ASEAN stage. And we have to learn how to manage that too. We have learned that we could maintain peace, we could maintain uh, stability among ourselves. I couldn't imagine Southeast Asia without ASEAN. We have problems, yes, but we have not made those problems more, uh, more critical or more much in the open. open Tonight, the President of the Philippines is coming here. The Philippines has not raised the issue of Sabah because of the ASEAN spirit. You think Thailand and Cambodia are having problems? Yes, but without ASEAN, it would be worse. We all appeal to the spirit of ASEAN. By the way, it's a very interesting issue, this Thailand and Cambodia. Two Buddhist countries fighting over a Hindu ruin. Here's the punchline. And I had a joke with Minister Marty about this. Two Muslims are mediating. <laughs> And we have been able to contain it. <laughs> he sent me notes. I call him up. You know, we compare notes. And I said, Marty, it's rather ironic, isn't it? Two Buddhist, one of them happened to be mine, two Buddhist countries fighting over a Hindu ruin, but two Muslims are mediating them <laughs> between them. But we have been able to, to uh, at least calm things down. <clears throat> The first time, and I will stop at this, that I realized that the pendulum has shifted was at the beginning of my own term as Secretary General of ASEAN. It was when Australia was campaigning to be a member of the Asia-Europe Summit. I was transiting in Hong Kong. I got a call from here, Canberra do something about it. We want to be in. And 
I said, I'm not in, I have the power to, to get them in, but certainly I'll do what I can when the opportunity comes. But here is it. In the Great Hall of the People in Beijing, the seat of the Communist Party, the Prime Minister of China, Mr. Wen Jiabao, sat at the head of the table, chair of the room. 48 members from Europe and from Asia, including all the ASEAN member states, were in that group. Bolosconi, Mr. Boroso, Mr. Merkel, uh, all the rest. Tony Blair didn't make it. He sent, um, he sent uh, David uh, Miller. That was October 2008. That was the beginning of the crisis. But they could feel the magnitude in Europe that this is going to be big. And you know what the European leaders said? From Merkel to Barroso to Berlusconi? Please, East Asia, please, China, keep it open, keep it humming, keep buying, keep imp importing from us. In the great heart of the people. And David Miliband took me aside and said, Mr. Secretary General, this is a very strange meeting indeed. We from the market economies. We from the West are asking a communist country to help. Things have changed. Pendulum, pendulum has shifted. And we are managing those changes together. The friendship, the support, the cooperation that Australia has given to us has been helpful. For us to realize the opportunities for us to be able to face the challenges, to manage many challenges coming our way as the center of that new gravity of the world, of the economic uh, growth. We could only survive together because of the long history, human, cultural, historical, political, strategic, that we have gone through together. From our perspective, in our eyes, you have been transformed. You are now part of us. And we hope that from your perspective, in your eyes, we have also been helpful, contributing, and helping you, managing your own challenges, your own problems. Thank you very much. Do you envision a future where ASEAN is awarded a Nobel Peace Prize for its peace and community? <laughs> <laughs> and on the flip side, what lessons do you think that ASEAN can draw from the challenges that are being faced in Europe? We are not in a hurry to have one currency. <laughs> It has never been on the table anyway. <coughs> no, I, I think Europe, you know, in hindsight, I thought we were going to get it when they said an international organization is going to get it. <laughs> no, no. No, I think, I think Europe has delivered a great, great service to themselves, among themselves, and it is important that they could settle the differences or are able to manage the differences, historical, deep, very, very bitter history between themselves. And they have become a, a, a successful uh, regional organization. It's a model of regional organization. Uh, so peace, stability, security that they have been able to maintain, and their willingness to engage with the world, trying to share the experience. I think it, it, it's noble. They're helping us too. But I have, I have also been saying that because of the differences in which we came into being the two organizations, Europe is our inspiration. But it cannot be our model. Because of the tremendous diversities that we have within our membership. But we take inspiration from Europe. A lot of things that have been achieved would be great if we could achieve, but uh, it cannot be enough. We are not a union, and uh, 
governance different, norms, values, history, language, everything. It's difficult to see one union as it in the near future. But I think we are on the right road. And I think we are contributing to our own region. And being that colonel, Mrs. Clinton called us fulcrum of emerging architectures in the region. Some call us the centrality. But I think if we can continue to play this role and can contribute to the evolution of East Asia as a community, small C, small C community, and that's what is happening. If we are able to do this into the future, why not a Nobel Prize? <laughs> uh, but certainly you will be taking part of the credit. <laughs> How much would you think the impact of the current South China Sea issue has in terms of um, economic cooperation between ASEAN and China? Not much, not much, because um, it's our largest trading partner about three, 300 billion US dollars a year, about 70 billion between Australia and ASEAN. Growth is about 15, 20% a year, always in China's favor. <laughs> uh, but the, the tension there is not affecting trade. Investment is not big enough. China, we've been telling China, look, this cannot be sustained. Growth, 15, 20% a year, and uh, the balance of trade is in your favor, 20, 30 billion US dollars a year. This cannot be sustained. Got to be some more investment coming from it. Uh, but it's not that much. What will happen is this, which is a lot of Japanese investment in China will find a way to Southeast Asia. For similar reason, but not the same reason. <laughs> they have their own problems. So the rise of China, the way you are witnessing, is giving a lot of anxiety in the region. Mm -hmm. And the result of that anxiety is different from different parts, two different parts. Uh, 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 a lot of Japanese interest, a lot of Japanese investment is looking south to Southeast Asia. Um, Korea is not feeling much yet, but prosperous, stable, secure, open, integrated Southeast Asia is in the interest of Korea. So um, you will see um, this uh, rise of China, flexing muscle of China uh, is having impact uh, in different ways and manifests in different forms in the region. Uh, at this point, trade with China is not our import to China, I mean, if it's going to be lowered, it's not because of the conflict, because the Chinese market, the Chinese economy itself is so slowing down. So, that's... that's Dr. Surin, this has been a, a rich and encouraging presentation to us. It's rich in its analysis of uh, the strengths and the prospects of, uh, of ASEAN, rich in your own personal experience, uh, but also encouraging for both for the future of ASEAN and for this, the role that Australia can play in the development of the, of the region. Promise me one thing. <laughs> you have found Southeast Asia, don't lose it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I was going to say that we've, I realised as you spoke that uh, unwittingly we've learnt something from ASEAN in constructing this institute. We respect the national integrity, the, the distinct identities of the, the component members, but we work in a framework that uh, identifies a Southeast Asian identity. Even more than that, we compete more broadly. We have something to give to the rest of Asia and to Australia and to the, the world. And I don't think we're going to get a Nobel Prize for it. <laughs> <laughs> we might do it. You get shared with us. Yes. <laughs>
I begin by adding my uh, warmest welcome to uh, Dr. Sirin and uh, again to thank him for, I think, a really masterful presentation. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to welcome you back here to the Australian National University. A little bit of history. When ANU was founded in 1946, a central part of the mandate uh, of this university was to study the states, societies and cultures uh, of our region. There was, of course, a strategic dimension to that mandate. Coming at the end of the Second World War, Australia very much wanted to understand its environment in order to avoid future surprises, I think, very much. But there was also a strong feeling that Australia's future would be entwined uh, with its neighbours, that we shared with many in Asia, and the Pacific for that matter, a set of aspirations for things like prosperity, democracy and justice, and that we might more quickly achieve these aspirations by working together. And I think those were some of the underpinning elements that uh, really were at the core of the establishment of this university. There was also, I think, a realisation that Australian culture could be enriched by the deep cultural resources which were present in Asia. And I do think if you look at Australia today uh, and the multicultural nature of that and how Australian society has been shaped by Asia compared to where it was at the end of the Second World War, I think you can see how this country has been transformed. The Australian National University, uh, in establishing what was then the Research School of Pacific Studies, was at the forefront uh, of Australia's post-war engagement uh, with uh, Asia. Southeast Asia has been central, I think, to the ANU mission of engagement with Asia in terms of things like trade or educational engagement, diplomatic cooperation, strategic importance, tourism, uh, human engagement. No region of the world is more important to Australia and to Australia's future than indeed Southeast Asia. And indeed, if I could do a little bit of advertising now, uh, there's no university, I think, in the world with a stronger and broader record in Southeast Asian studies than ANU. Our contributions to the study of countries like Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia and Vietnam have been really quite remarkable. We have an outstanding team of scholars engaged with the work, indeed, of ASEAN. The Australian National University is, for instance, the only university in Australia which has consistently taught languages such as Indonesian, Thai, Vietnamese and Javanese, as well as offering uh, Burmese and Tatum from time to time. I think it's a remarkable record uh, in Asian languages. Now, after ne nearly seven decades, as we've heard, we've discovered Southeast Asia. Uh, we are taking a step which some might say is indeed long overdue by creating an institute which will bind these various elements of the university together. The ANU Southeast Asian Institute will bring together the university's expertise on this complex and diverse region and will act as a window to the world on the university's incomparable expertise in Southeast Asian affairs. So I think it's a, a remarkable ability to pull together uh, the many elements of this university, which are really quite remarkable. So this evening's event, I hope, is just the first of many that will strengthen the impact of ANU on this important field. Uh, I'd like to thank, in particular, Andrew McIntyre and his team for their tremendous work uh, in bringing the ANU Southeast Asia Institute together, for bringing it to this point and I have very much pleasure in well and truly declaring the Institute launched. Congratulations.